Good morning, and welcome to Worship with First Church. I am so glad that you are able to worship with us today wherever you are. This year is a jubilee year for First Church. In Bible times, the year of jubilee happened every 50 years, and so it was a special year. And I don't know about you, but I am looking forward to seeing how God is going to work among us during this jubilee year. We're starting out this special year with an emphasis on contentment. And this week, we're focusing on Philippians chapter 4. And in Philippians 4, in verse 12, Paul writes, I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. What is that secret? That's what Pastor Matt is going to talk about in his sermon today. Before we begin worship, we just want to remind you to please take a minute to fill out your connection card. You can find the link in the upper right hand corner of your screen. And this is a great way for us to follow up with you on things coming up here at First Church. Also, we want to invite kids to be a part of Jumpin' Jesus, a time to enjoy inflatables, pizza, crafts, face painting, and more. Parents, come with your children to this free community event in the Christian Life Center on March 2nd from 11 a.m. until 1 p.m. And for more details, just check out the church website. Finally, Ash Wednesday. Ash Wednesday this year is February 14th, and we will be having a simple, shorter worship experience at 6 o'clock, both in the FEC Sanctuary and online. The in-person service will include the imposition of ashes, and we invite you to be a part of this time of worship as we begin our Lenten journey. Hi, First Church friends. Have you ever heard any, maybe friends of yours or kids at school, when a parent, when their parent or when a teacher had asked them something or ask them to explain something and they kind of roll their eyes and they go, whatever. And it's really, really disrespectful. That whatever just, I don't know, it's just not right. And when I hear kids say that to parents, I just think about, you know, the Ten Commandments and how we're to honor our father and mother. And in the Bible, in Philippians verse 8, Paul has something to say about that whatever. Take a listen. Finally, brothers and sisters, whatever is true, whatever is noble, whatever is right, whatever is pure, whatever is lovely, whatever is admirable, if anything is excellent or praiseworthy, think about such things. Whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice, and the God of peace will be with you. So instead of being disrespectful with the whatever, the Bible says that we should focus on whatever is good and true and right and noble and kind of filter ourselves from the things that can really make us, you know, want other things. Let me read a little further down. I know what it's like to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in every situation. And I think being content, being happy with the things that you have, is a really important thing. Because sometimes we can think our stuff is really great, and when we look at our friend, he might have better video games and he might have a nicer bike and he might have all these other things that we might start to want. And that's not okay. You know, the Ten Commandments also talk about coveting and wanting other things that people have. But God wants us to be content or happy in any situation because he gives us everything we need. Hmm. So, will you pray with me, friends? Dear Heavenly Father, I just thank you 
I thank you for giving us the Ten Commandments that we can learn to live good lives. I thank you that you're always with us. I thank you that you give us what we need. And Lord, help us to focus on whatever is good and whatever is true and whatever is noble instead of focusing on what our friends might have that we may want. Help us to be happy and content in every situation. In your name I pray, amen. So boys and girls, be content with what you have. Turn your kind of a disrespectful whatever into thinking about those things, whatever is good and right and noble. And remember that God will provide you with everything you need. Take care, boys and girls. We'll see you soon. I was buried beneath my shame. And who could carry that kind of weight? It was my tomb till I met you. I was breathing but not alive And all my failures I tried to hide It was my tomb Till I met you And you called my name And I ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day you call my name and i ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your glorious day now your mercy has saved my soul and now your freedom is all that I know the old man knew Jesus when I met you and you called my name and I ran out of that grave out of the darkness into your You. My sin was heavy, but chains break at the weight of your glory. I needed shelter, I was an orphan. Now you call me a citizen of heaven. When I was broken, you were my healing. Now your love is the air that I'm breathing. I have a future, my eyes are open. And when you call my name, I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day You called my name And I ran out of that grave Out of the darkness Into your glorious day Will you join with me in prayer? God, we give you thanks that you call us into your light, into your peace. May we experience your peace in a way that does truly transcend 
our understanding. A way that goes beyond what makes sense to us, even goes beyond our ability to describe in words. We pray that you would fill us with your peace so that we don't chase after peace and contentment in things that will never satisfy. Lord, help us to think about what is true and noble and right, what is pure and lovely and admirable, and not be drawn to false idols that look so satisfying but can never bring the deep equilibrium and complete contentment that only you offer. Like Paul, may we find the secret of contentment so that we too can stand on the firm foundation of Jesus Christ and rest in the everlasting arms of the Father. Lord, we name before you something we think we need to be content. Something that today is challenging our sense of contentment. A possession that we think we need. A relationship that isn't what we want it to be. A skill we don't have. A position we desire. Lord, today we don't pray that you would change our circumstances. Today we pray that you would change us so that no matter our circumstances, we would have deep contentment in you, trusting that our God will meet all our needs according to his riches of the glory in Jesus Christ. It is in his name that we pray together. Amen. When we gather together for worship, even when it's limited to online, we have an opportunity to glorify God by offering our gifts. We invite you to sing, even though you might be alone at home, and to give. Thank you for your giving, whether that is online, on our app, via texting, or mailing in your offering to the church office. First Church wants to be a church that seeks transformation everywhere. And so we support other ministries in our community and go beyond through our second mile giving. One of those ministries is Expectations Women's Center, a ministry that is located within walking distance of the church and that provides pregnancy and relationship services to expectant mothers and fathers. Thank you for your faithful giving that glorifies God and provides for the needs of others. where you want to be. The question is, can you be thankful where you are? Good morning, everybody, and welcome to February. The calendars have flipped, and here we are moving into a brand new month. Uh, but we are continuing today in our sermon series on contentment. And so as we get ready to focus on that idea today, the scripture that I want to invite us to give some focus to is in the book of Philippians, chapter 4, verses 10 through 13. And so let me invite us now to hear and receive these words of life today. I rejoiced greatly in the Lord 
that at last you renewed your concern for me. Indeed, you were concerned, but you had no opportunity to show it. I am not saying this because I am in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. Again, as we start to reflect on those words, would you join with me in a word of prayer? Almighty God, this day, may the words of my mouth and the meditations of all of our hearts be pleasing and acceptable in your sight, shaking us to new life in you. O Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. Especially now that it is February, Christmas might feel like a distant memory at this point, but it really wasn't that long ago that we were singing Silent Night, and joy to the world and all the other wonderful Christmas carols. In fact, it was only about six weeks ago. And one of the things that I'm intrigued by every year at Christmas is which hot gifts rise to the top, because every year it is something different. So this past year in 2023, some of the gifts that rose to the top and were most in demand were some things like Apple's AirPods Max, a wireless headphones, uh, there was also a commodity, a desire for a light bulb camera. Uh, there was the Vital Flex Core device. That was uh, a hot one. And then uh, the Black Falcon 4K drone was also something that people sought after a lot. And then one other one that you've probably heard of, Stanleys were in great, great demand. It will not surprise you that those gifts that I just mentioned for 2023 were not the top gifts in previous years. So, for example, back in 2016, there were these things called Hatchimals. Now, I don't know if you know what a Hatchimal is. I certainly didn't, but it's described as what you get when you cross a magic lamp with a Furby, and we'll talk about a Furby in a moment. It's an interactive toy that hatches out of a plastic egg. So you uh, rub and you tap the egg to coax this furry creature out of its shell so that it can be taught to dance and repeat words and play games. So again, no idea if you've ever seen one of this, but really that was a uh, sought after gift a number of years ago in 2016. If you go back even a little bit farther in 2013, it was Big Hugs Elmo. Elmo would give anyone who desired or needed a hug. Uh, he would even offer you a lullaby to help you fall asleep. Don't know if any of you have a big hugs Elmo. If we go back even farther in 2000, one of the top gifts was a Razor scooter. So they were sleeker than a bike, but more safe than a skateboard. They're lightweight, they fold up easily. I remember actually for our kids, uh, we got these and they used them a ton, uh, especially to be able to get outside and burn off some energy. Uh, but my favorite one of all might be if you go all the way back to 1998, the top gift in 1998 was this thing called a Furby. Now, these were toys with big owl-like eyes, uh, and they spoke different languages of different kinds, but the goal was for them to learn the English language the more they were exposed to it and slowly start to repeat words of the English language. These things were all the rage all the way back in 1998. Now, how they were all the rage, I don't know. That's another story, uh, but it rose to the top of the list. Those are some of the things in previous years that people have sought after come the Christmas season. Now, we were talking mainly about toys, but the reality is the same thing happens for us in regards to cars or clothes or other elements that at different times, these things rise up and they become sought after elements. There's always something new er, as we talked a little bit last week, or better, more inventive that's coming along and being pushed at us. Now, sometimes things wear out and sometimes things break, and sometimes we do just need something new, but more often than not, business owners and advertisers count on one simple reality to sell their products, and that reality is this. They know that human beings are rarely content. 
human beings regularly struggle uh, with being content. So very often we may not need something new, but when we see it, we want it. And so much of the commercial drive that happens, especially at Christmas every year, but really all year round, is built on this idea that deep within us, there's a sense of discontentment. That what satisfied us last year will no longer satisfy us this year, which is why every year there are new sets of hot items that rise to the top and are sought after. The reality is we human beings like the next new shiny thing in general. It's part of our makeup, but advertisers also work very hard to uh, prey on that discontent within us. We all know what this feels like. We can have something that's perfectly good, working fine, works the way it's supposed to, and we're happy with it until we hear about the next, uh, the next new iPhone or the next new fashion or whatever it might be. Just this past year, at the end of the year, my normal car needed some repair work. And so far, it's been an excellent car. I have no complaints. I have no desire for a new one. But do you know what the dealers did? While they were working on my car and doing some maintenance work, they gave me a loaner car. And not just a loaner car, they gave me a brand new loaner car. We're talking under 100 miles. And so at first I was like, why are you giving me a brand new car to be able to use and enjoy? And what I began to realize and what some other people shared with me is that it can be tempting to spend, you know, a few days or a few weeks driving this brand new vehicle to start to think, you know, maybe I want this one. Uh, this one's a little nicer, a little better than the one that's being fixed right now. And even though mine was perfectly functional, worked well, it starts to plant those seeds that maybe I want this new one instead. Why? My old one, for whatever reason now, is no longer, I'm no longer content with it in light of the newer one. I've got all this on my mind today in general because of the sermon series that we're in talking about cultivating contentment, but specifically I have it on my mind because of what Paul shares with us today in Philippians chapter 4, verses 10 to 13. Here, Paul shares one of the most remarkable truths and statements in all of Scripture when he says this in Philippians chapter 4, verse 12. He says, I have learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Now, think about that. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. That is quite a claim by Paul. And what Paul is saying here, and I love the way that, that Tim Keller shares this, he, he's really giving us, in a sense, this essence that he's discovered what he calls the secret of deep equilibrium. In the face of anything, even death and persecution, it means that he's able to stay in a state of balance, a state of calm. I personally find that to be a captivating description, the secret of deep equilibrium. Now, most people I know do not find themselves in any state of equilibrium, let alone a deep equilibrium. Most of us want what Paul says he has, but that we struggle to find. We know this in the face of bills or work or bosses or employees or professors or other students or mom, or dad, or health issues, or social media comparisons, or you name it, we struggle to have a sense of equilibrium, especially deep equilibrium. Now, I don't want to discredit any of the factors that I just mentioned, because they're all stressful. They can all cause discontent. But what I also want us to realize today is that Paul is facing torture and death, and still he can be completely at peace, still, Facing death and torture, he can experience a deep equilibrium. According to Acts chapter 16, the congregation at Philippi was the first church established by Paul and Timothy on their first missionary journey. The letter's tone reflects a warm and intimate relationship between Paul and the Philippians. And Philippians focuses on elements such as joy and conviction in the midst of adversity and the Christian life in the midst of legalistic and liberal extremes and the nature of the Lordship of Christ. And it focuses on what we're talking about here today, this sense of contentment. It's interesting how Paul phrases his focus on contentment. Look again how he says it, 
Philippians 4, verse 12. He says, I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation. Well, that's worth noting. Everybody likes to know secrets. Uh, when my wife Jen was growing up, her grandmother, they called her Super G, <laughs> used to make this wonderful chocolate cake with white icing that was amazing. It was so good. Nobody could ever quite replicate it. Hers was always better than everyone else's. When Jen and the family finally asked her, what's your secret? She said, well, first, you have to use devil's food cake mix with pudding. Can't use the kind without. And the icing has to be whipped at exactly the right speed. Uh, that's what she said were the extra steps, the secret to her success in recipe. And I will tell you that it resulted in a cake unlike any other, with a consistency unlike any other. It was so, so good. In life, we like to know the steps or the ingredients, the secret that will make us happy or content or satisfied. Well, in Philippians, especially chapters 1 leading up to 4, Paul lays out some of the secret steps that lead to contentment. Listen to some of what he shares. In chapter 1, verse 3, Paul talks about thanksgiving and prayer. He then notes that there's a bigger perspective for us to live into. It's a gospel perspective. Chapter 1, verse 12 says, Now I want you to know, brothers and sisters, that what's happened to me has actually served to advance the gospel and continues to proclaim. And he says in verse 19, Yes, and I will continue to rejoice. He then gives us a reminder and an encouragement to continue to live in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. Verse 27 of chapter 1, and then he speaks of humility and the importance of valuing others above ourselves. And then Paul continues and he says, do then everything without grumbling or arguing. And finally, Paul reminds us not to put our confidence in the things of this world, but to place our hope and our faith in the things of God. Now, that's a lot, I understand. It's, it's kind of a winding roadmap, but, but listen to the roadmap again because it leads to this secret of contentment. The, the roadmap of giving thanks in prayer, uh, then living into a gospel perspective, living into that perspective with a sense of humility, without grumbling, choosing to hope in God, these become the roadmap to the secret of contentment the recipe as it were. Now, I admit that is not an easy recipe to live into, but we all have a decision to make as followers of Christ. Will we choose that kind of a roadmap or will we choose what the world is trying to sell us? Our world tells us over and over again that the secret to contentment is the right gift, the right job, the right spouse, the right accomplishment, or fill in the blank. But as we know, eventually those things always leave us wanting. But then here's Paul. And Paul, remember, he has been beaten. He's been incarcerated. He's experienced just about every difficult thing you can imagine. And he's telling us, but in the midst of that, I've found the secret. And notice here, Paul's not promoting something he doesn't have. He's not pointing to something that he'll have someday after this life here on earth. He's actually sharing about what he currently has in the present, in the midst of the trials that he's facing. This is not make-believe or wishful thinking on the part of Paul. This is not just Paul pointing beyond himself to someday. It's what he has and experiences right now. And part of what Paul is doing here then is he's showing us that when it comes to contentment, it's not just a goal to aim for, it's something to experience here and now. Scripture encourages us to be content here and now, even in the hardest of times. But the question becomes how? If we go back to the Ten Commandments, you've heard of the Ten Commandments. The tenth one says this, you shall not covet. You should not covet anything, your, your neighbor's house or wife or servant or donkey or ox or anything of your neighbor's. Coveting is the opposite of contentment. Paul here in Philippians chapter 4 today is sharing the positive of what we hear in the 10th commandment. The negative, according to the 10th commandment, is thou shalt not covet. But the positive, as Paul is saying, is I've learned the secret of being content in every situation. He doesn't have to covet because he's content. 
Covet basically means to want something really, 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 really bad. But that doesn't even do it justice. Because we all know there are good wants in life and there are bad wants in life. So some good wants, things that we might want that are ultimately good would be things like wanting to move up in your career. That can be a good thing. Wanting to do well in school. That can be a good thing. Wanting to serve your family well. That can be a good thing. But when there's a switch to the coveting, we want to move up in our career so badly that it, it shapes our entire self-worth and forces us to do anything by any means necessary to get there, even if it means cheating or swindling or hurting others or even leaving your family behind so that you can experience the success there. The covening drives that kind of discontent. As Keller comments, in wanting, you are the dog and the want is the tail. But in coveting, the want is the dog and you are the tail. Because when the want becomes the dog, then it wags you. You know then that in that moment, coveting is occurring. It's that feeling I have to have this or else, or else I'll never be content. The 10th commandment again is about not coveting, which is a mere reflection of the first covenant that thou shall have no other gods before me, the one true God. Part of the essence of not coveting, part of the essence then of finding contentment is to love God first. To have that gospel perspective that Paul laid out for us in that roadmap to the secret of contentment. And notice this, the 10 commandments, they're called commandments. They're exactly that. They're not wishes, they're not suggestions. And we should be so glad for that. Why? Because if contentment is directly encouraged and expected and commanded by God, it means it's possible and available to all of us. But if contentment is only wishful thinking or something to consider or a possible invitation, then it's only available to some of us. This is a really big deal. The text does not say it would be great if some of you did not covet your neighbor's home, that's not what it says. It says, you, as in all of you, shall not covet your neighbor's home. This is powerful because here's the truth. We hear of people like Paul who under the threat of death and persecution still says, I am content. And it can be too easy to think that, oh, people like him, uh, spiritual deep people like Paul, these superheroes of the faith, they have the ability to be content no matter what. But that doesn't really apply to me. But what Paul is telling us here today is that we can all know this secret. We can all be content, whether we have a lot to eat or a little, whether I'm getting along with my spouse or not, whether my kids turned out as I expected or not, whether I aced the test or failed the test, whether I was promoted in my job or demoted in my job, whether I can easily pay my bills or figure out how to make ends meet, whether there is peace or whether there is war, whether my team wins or whether my team loses, in all of it, we can have contentment. And that's not just wishful thinking, says Paul. It just raises the million dollar question of how. How can we have such contentment? To figure that out, we have to go back and do this quick overview of what Paul is sharing. Remember, again, Paul shares that contentment comes in the secret. Remember the roadmap we looked at just a little bit ago. What does he mean by the term secret? I think the simplest way to put it is just that Paul is pointing out something then that's not obvious to us. For example, in your mind, think for a moment, how would you answer the question of how can you right now have true contentment? How can you right now have true contentment? What comes to mind for you? Can you even think of something that would allow you to say, oh, that would allow me over the long haul to truly have contentment? It's rarely obvious. It's difficult for us to stop and to realize and to think what actually allows us contentment in the long run. So even though we want it, we're not quite sure even how to name it and certainly not to discover it and then certainly not to maintain it. In fact, sometimes maintaining contentment can be harder than finding it to begin with. Because for many of us, living in contentment remains a feeling that comes and goes. It's not a state of deep and continuous equilibrium like Paul shares. 
Secrets are kind of like that. They, they tend to elude us. They're not always obvious. So we have to search for them and discover them and live into them. I love the way C.S. Lewis once said it. I think this is so deep and so profound in regards to the secret of contentment. He says, all the things that have ever deeply possessed your soul have been but hints of it. Tantalizing glimpses, promises never quite fulfilled, echoes that died away just as they caught your ear. But if it should really become manifest, if there ever came an echo that did not die away but swelled into the sound itself, you would know it. Beyond all possibility of doubt, you would say, here at last is the thing I was made for. We cannot tell each other about it. It's the secret signature of each soul, the incommunicable and unappeasable want, the thing we desired before we met our wives or made our friends or chose our work, and which we shall still desire on our deathbeds. When the mind no longer knows wife or work or friend, while we are, this is. And if we lose this, we lose all. I think the it that Lewis is referring to here is this form of contentment. I think it's discovering the sweet spot between our individual purpose and living into the deepest desires and the needs of the world around us that no external circumstance can alter or change. One of the reasons that contentment eludes us so often is because we think we know what will give us contentment. We continue to think, oh, it's the right spouse. Oh, it's the right gift. Oh, it's the right achievement. Oh, it's the right set of circumstances. It's the right amount of money. We think we'll get those things and now life will be good and I'll be content forever. But the reason that we keep exploring, the reason the contentment never lasts is because the satisfaction never lasts. And thus we enjoy uh, the arousing, a hint of contentment when it comes our way. But when we make the thing that we think gives us contentment the ultimate thing, we make it an idol to pursue, it will always leave us wanting every single time. Contentment will never last as long as we seek our contentment outside of the ultimate thing, and the ultimate thing is God. Idols arouse our desire for the ultimate without being the ultimate. And thus, when we pursue that line of thinking, we find ourselves in discontent every time. What Paul would tell us today is that the ultimate is God. The ultimate is Jesus. That's what you are looking for. That's what you long for. That is the source of your contentment. Throughout Philippians chapter 4, we hear Paul say it this way in different phrases and places. He says in verse 4, the Lord is near. And whatever you have learned or received or heard from me or seen in me, put it into practice and the God of peace will be with you. And then verse 19, my God will meet your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. This, says Paul, is the secret. Only God, only Jesus as the ultimate will truly satisfy, will truly provide contentment. And Paul is not saying this in a religious way. He's not saying this, I'm a super spiritual person, and so listen to me way. He's not saying this because I'm a preacher kind of way. He's saying it as a son of the living God. He is saying it because it is true. He is saying it because he is reality. He's saying it because it is. Our contentment ultimately is only ever found in the person, the one of Jesus Christ. Do we know that? Do we understand that? Do we embrace that reality? And when we understand this, we discover then the secret of contentment. We realize contentment is learned and not just discovered. Earlier, we noted that contentment is found when we seek the ultimate thing. Well, guess what? We can learn the ultimate thing. This is significant because discovering something happens more by chance. We kind of stumble upon it. And sometimes that happens, and that's a good thing. But discovery seems to have a sense of randomness to it. Back in December, a Belgian father and his son were shocked to discover that a souvenir that had been hanging in their hallway for some 50 years was actually an authentic artifact from the lost Italian city of Pompeii. The piece had been hanging in their home for 50 years, but now the family was getting ready to move and they decided to have the object appraised. 
It was then discovered to be this authentic Pompeii artifact that had been reported stolen 50 years earlier. And meanwhile, what they discovered is that it had been a replica that tourists were looking at in the actual official museum. That's discovery. It's, it's random in nature. It happens when people accidentally stumble upon something by chance. And again, it's wonderful when it happens. It's wonderful to discover. But there's no guarantee that's going to happen. It just sort of happens. Not everybody finds that kind of treasure among them. But learning is different. Learning is something all of us can actively engage in. And that should be helpful for us because it means that contentment, once learned, can be available to each and every one of us. Because we can learn it, then it's within reach. In this way, it's not an accident. We learn the secret. It's a process that we can engage in. So how do we do that? I want to be really practical here as we draw some of our time to a close. I want to give us some actual steps that we can use to learn the secret of contentment. And again, appreciate the observations of Keller in lifting up these steps. So step number one to learning the secret of contentment. One, you must unmask coveting for what it is. Coveting again is that reference to what we really, 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 really want. And we'll go to any length necessary to get it. It's what we make as the idols or the ultimates in our lives. Idols are those things that we want so badly that if we don't have them, we are absolutely miserable. We are discontent. So idols become the things that give us our worth, our value, our identity. So when we're unhappy or discontent, what we have to ask ourselves is, what besides God has become my salvation, my joy, my identity, my loyalty, my delight, my preoccupation? Now, I will warn you, this requires us to be ruthlessly honest with ourselves. It requires honest and deep self-awareness. What besides Jesus has become a greater occupation or preoccupation in our lives than Jesus himself? We cannot forget that the things that we are after are actually after us. Whenever we get just a bit of free time, what is it our minds are automatically captivated by? What do our hearts automatically wander to? We have to name those things, confront those things, be ruthlessly honest about them, and name them. What in our life right now is taking the place of God? I invite you right now to name it in your heart because we cannot navigate that which we cannot name. So first, we name that. Secondly, we then preach the gospel to ourselves. So in the most basic terms, do whatever you need to do to remind yourselves personally where your true worth comes from. Remind yourself of what Jesus has done for you. Remind yourself of what Jesus says about you and how much Jesus loves you. Remind yourself that you are righteous in Jesus and through Jesus alone. Remind yourself that Jesus looks at you and says, I love you, I love you, I love you. I lived for you, I died for you, I rose again for you. Let that reality sink into your heart. Last week, I encouraged us to do a more negative version of this in chasing the wind. And I said, let's remind ourselves and say out loud, I will not chase the wind. Well, this week, I wanna frame that in a more positive way. And I invite you this week, whenever you need to, just stop and say in your heart or out loud, I am so loved by Jesus. I am so loved by Jesus. Preach the gospel to yourself. Remind us then, Lord, Philippians 4.13, that I can do all this through him who gives me strength. It's through the gospel. Then we embrace what I would call the icing discipline. The best cakes have a wonderful icing. I just told you a little bit ago about my favorite cake that Jen now makes, the one her grandmother taught her, the chocolate cake with the white icing. I love it, but I don't eat that icing every day. I don't eat that icing as my full diet. What would happen if I only ate the icing on the cake every day, all day? It would not take long for me to be a mess. In life, there are lots of things to enjoy. And as Christians, we enjoy those pleasures, but we don't idolize those pleasures. So many of us are trying to find contentment in life by only getting to the good things, only the icings of life as it were. Not only will we get tired of the icing if that's all we ate, but we would get sick. 
We need protein and vegetables and fruits to truly be healthy. For us as Christians, finding health in what really matters means being involved in disciplines that draw us closer to God. It means not just pursuing our own pleasures or the things that are easy or the things that make us feel really good. In other words, we got to keep pleasures as just pleasures, enjoy them, but it's not all that we pursue. Because when we elevate pleasures in their importance in our lives, eventually we make them idols. We have to let the icing only be the icing, to be enjoyed sparingly. Otherwise, if we expect life to only give us icing or good experiences, which many of us do, we'll never be content when some of the non-icing issues come our way. So to learn to be content, we have to unmask and name what we covet, be ruthlessly honest. Secondly, we preach the gospel to ourselves. I am so loved by Jesus. And then we practice the icing discipline. And finally, lastly, obey. Obey the commands that God gives to us. Obey where God is leading you. Don't just listen. Don't just hear the words. Actually do it. Actually put it into practice. Learn it by doing it. Because without obeying, we'll never learn full contentment. Paul obeyed God even in hard times. No matter how difficult, no matter how overwhelming the circumstances, Paul obeyed. Which is why then eventually Paul with unwavering peace, with deep equilibrium, could say, as he says in Philippians chapter 4, verse 19, and my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Paul didn't just hope those words. Paul learned those words. And that's the secret. Paul learned. And so can we. Philippians chapter 4, verses 11 to 13. I'm not saying this because I'm in need, for I have learned to be content whatever the circumstances. I know what it is to be in need, and I know what it is to have plenty. I've learned the secret of being content in any and every situation, whether well-fed or hungry, whether living in plenty or in want. I can do all this through him who gives me strength. The secret of contentment. Paul learned it, and so can we. Thanks be to God. Every week in this particular sermon series, we've given you a specific challenge that we've invited you throughout the week to come to engage in. This week, the challenge that we want to give you is this. We invite you every day to share in, to say aloud, the first commandment, that thou shall have no other gods before me, says God. Again, we invite you to share that every day. Thou shall have no other God before me. That that might be a, a point of anchoring in our day every week, every day this week, to help us experience contentment in the love of Christ with that gospel perspective first. Keeping that in mind, and with that invitation this week, I invite us now to go in the name of God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, learning the deep equilibrium and contentment that is only found in Christ Jesus our Lord. Go in peace and serve the Lord. Amen. Thanks again for joining us for worship today. If you're new here and would like to connect with us, be sure to check out the First Church website or app, our weekly newsletter, and our Facebook and our Instagram. We're really grateful that you've spent part of your morning with us, and we hope that you have a great week.